Hi there. Uh, so great to be here today. And it's so nice we could all be together wherever you are on the face of the earth. Uh, just want to say that Jesus loves you so much. And uh, it's a beautiful thing. Jesus not only loves us, but he, um, he loves his creation. He loved the Garden of Eden, and things kind of went bad after Adam and Eve kind of messed up there. And I, I just like to say many times we blame Eve for quote unquote biting the apple and then having Adam do it too. We don't know if it was an apple. We just use apple because we all like apples. Most of us do, I guess. And uh, so um, he loved Adam and Eve dearly and he loves each one of you. He loves me. Sometimes I don't, I, I'll, just t I'll just say this. Uh, there was a time in my life in 2014, I was going through the deepest valley that I've ever gone through. And the 23rd Psalm where it says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no, no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. I remember that valley in 2014 that I was walking through. And I remember getting to the point where I, I just had it in my mind that even Jesus didn't love me anymore. I was so low. And I walked over to my little baby grand piano there in the, I call it the piano room. There's a fireplace there. It's a, just a nice setting. I was there all alone. Nobody else was in the house. And I walked over and sat down and started playing and singing the song, Jesus Loves Me. I don't know where it came from. I guess it was from the Lord. But I sat there and tried to sing, and I wept. When, I, when I, it came back to me that Jesus does really love me. And that meant so much to me at that point. It was like a turning point uh, in that valley where I started climbing up out of that valley, and Jesus was with me the whole, all the way. And... Um, I don't think God wants us to have to go through times like that. But when we do, the Bible promises that all things work together for good to them that love the Lord, to those who are called according to his purpose. And uh, so I was crying out to God at that point. Didn't know what to do. So low that I felt that Jesus didn't love me anymore. But I cried out to God in my despair. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Cry out to God, exclamation mark. We need to cry out to God more often. And, I, and I, when I hear, think of the word cry, sometimes I remember crying before the Lord. And I wasn't screaming out like I did sometimes in my life when I cried out. And we're going to talk about some of these things. We're going to talk about some of the times where God's people cried out to him and he answered their prayers instantly, just right away. And the Lord answered their prayers. It'll say they cried out to God and he answered their prayers. And sometimes I think we need to get so desperate, so uh, knowing uh, that we need God. Sometimes we get to going and we just kind of forget about God. Things are going pretty good. But when times are tough, times get hard, and you don't know what to do, you don't know where to turn, we cry out to God and God answers our prayers. I was going down the road yesterday. I was going to an appointment. And I was on Skelly Road there, just outside of Chambersburg, and I'm going along. I just turned in to Skelly Road there at the stop sign. I was going up Skelly Road, and I looked up ahead, and I saw this black on the highway, on the road, isn't it? On the highway, it's just a back road, two-lane road, and I saw black in my lane up ahead. And as I got a little closer, then I saw some white on this black. Then I realized what it was, and you all know what it was, but I want to back up a little bit. Um, Years ago, I was going down the road, and I knew in my heart that God had said in Psalm 37 that if we delight ourselves in him, in God, that he'll give us the desires of our heart. And I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that he was going to supply my needs according to God's riches and glory through Christ Jesus, our Lord. I knew that he would supply my needs. But later on in life, I realized that, yes, he even wants to take care of our desires, our wants, 
Psalms 37 says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I read one translation here some time ago, a couple months ago, and it said, The Lord is my shepherd, I have everything I need. Well, that's not what it says. It says, I shall not want. Yes, I have everything I need, and God's supplying my needs. But in Psalm chapter 1, verse 1, it says, Hey, he'll take care of your wants too. In Psalm 37, delight thyself in the Lord, and he'll give you the desires of thine heart. And I go back, I don't know how many years, maybe 10, 15 years ago, I was going down the road and the same thing happened to me. I saw black up ahead on the road and then I saw white and I knew what it was. It was a skunk. And um, I, uh, I said, Lord, you said you'd give me the desires of my heart if I delight myself in you. And, I, and it was like, <laughs> it's such a little thing. Maybe God isn't concerned about it, but he is. He's concerned about every aspect of your life. And, uh, and so I said, Lord, I don't want to smell this skunk. I, I don't like skunk, 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 can't even say skunk. I, I don't like the smell of a skunk. And I choose today to not smell it. I wish, I just want you, I'm praying, Lord, that you'll take care of that desire of my heart and that I don't smell that skunk. And, and uh, it just brought me great joy as I drove past that dead skunk on the road, that roadkill. And uh, took in a big, deep breath. And there was nothing, no smell of skunk. And it was just a little thing, but it just tickled me. It tickled me that, that God actually cares about the little things in our lives. And uh, smell is one of the things, one of my senses that I'm very, uh, I have a really good sense of smell. I smell things that nobody around me smells sometimes. It might be really faint, but I'll, my nose will pick up on it. And just recently, I was uh, somewhere, and I smelled this beautiful smell. It's, it's happened three or four times in the last month or two. I'll, have the, I'll smell this. I sense it. And um, over the last years, I have this favorite place in our house. It's in the, like, it's like a family room right next to our kitchen. The kitchen and family are all one great big room. It's like, I think it's 24 by 32. And it's kitchen and family room. We have a lot of good fellowship in that room. And, and in that family room, there's my big chair. It's a recliner, and uh, I think it's a lazy boy. It's such a sweet chair, and, and I've said more than once, this is my favorite spot in this old house. It's an old farmhouse, and uh, I love getting in that chair, and I always have a book. Uh, right now, the book, one of the books, I'm reading three of them right now. I, I read more than one book at a time. I like to have a book at different places throughout the house. So when I stop and sit down, I have something that I can pick up. Maybe I'll only read a paragraph and it just jerk me around, you know, and just, oh, this is just what I needed, Lord. And, and so I have these books that I read and it's a sweet spot in the house. I think that it's a portal, that area of the house, that whole corner of this big room. Uh, and my wife's desk, her little office area is right at the, uh, at the one side, at the one end, it's there. And then my chair is just out from that desk area, probably 10 feet maybe from the desk. And more than once I've walked from the next room over, from the stairway over, through the double doors into that room, and it'd be the sweet smell. Or sometimes I would even see, I think it was maybe my angel or it was the Lord Jesus, I would actually see a glimpse there in that I'm going to call it a portal. Right there in that portal, I would see a glimpse of the Lord, and it would just fade away as I walked by. And I just kind of, you know, that makes kind of makes the hair stand up on your back uh, for us guys. Uh, and uh, you get these little cold chills, maybe goosebumps. And I remember going over and sitting down in my chair and just be blessed. Just be blessed all over, more than anywhere else. <laughs> and, and it was just, it's a sweet thing. Favorite place on the face of the earth. I get so many. It's where I talk to the Lord a lot, and He talks to me. When we pray, we don't. We need to uh, give God some time too. Sometimes we just get on our knees and we just blah, 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 on and on and on we go, and we never give God a chance to talk to us. But in that chair, many times I've just stopped and listened, and I've learned so many get great truths, uh, so many comforting things, so many things that were encouraging uh, from our Lord. And if you don't have that in your life, I, 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 I can't wait 
Uh, we usually wait to the end of a service to invite people to receive Christ as their Savior. Receive him right now. It's that easy. Just cry out to God. We're, we're talking about crying out to God. Just, just let him hear your heart's cry. And so many times, uh, like I was saying, the, the little skunk thing, it was, it's such a small thing. But God wants to take care of all those. Anything that your heart's desire. He, if you're a child of God, he wants to, to take care of you just like you as a daddy or a mother want to take care of your little children. If your little, if your little uh, kid wants well, peace candy, uh, if mom won't let you have it, they know to run to dad because he'll let you have that piece of candy probably sometimes. Dad, it's, dads are softies. And kids can get away more with dad and sometimes it's vice versa. But just little things God wants to take care of. And one day my wife said, I was, I was uh, just uh, talking about something little that the Lord had done. And I was excited about it. And she said to me, she said, uh, man, Harold said, it doesn't take much to make you happy, does it? <laughs> I said, <laughs> it, it was just a little funny I want to bring in. I said to her, I said, you be careful. I said, I married you. <laughs> Doesn't take much to make me happy. But uh, she walked right into that one. And uh, we have a lot of fun. I love when she laughs. Sometimes we just, almost every day, there'll be something that will come up, and we just have to stop and laugh. And she has such a good laugh. It just blesses me when she laughs. But uh, just little things. Uh, little things like coming down the stairs. My wife gets up be most of the time before I do. And she has breakfast. Uh, just that aroma coming up the stairway as I come down the steps, ba that bacon. There's four pieces of bacon, those two eggs from our little red hens. Uh, in the, they have a hen tractor that they live in. It's one that you, I hook to it with my golf cart, crank the wheels down so that the chicken house comes up. And then I pull it up the length of the chicken house and they get fresh white clover and grass and any other weeds and grit that they want to scratch in the dirt and maybe get some kind of mineral or something that they're looking for. But uh, these little things uh, just make me happy. There's a little boy I remember coming home from church on Sunday morning. Well, it might have been Sunday afternoon till we got home. And my mother would have a roast, a chunk of roast beef in the oven, and she'd set it or whatever. Clear back then, that was in the 50s. I was born in 51, so I remember as a little boy coming home from church and the aroma when you walk through the door into our kitchen, uh, as a boy, the aroma of that roast beef just permeating the whole house it smells so good. And there's little things that just um, made me feel good. We, we always would butcher our bull. We'd keep a bull for probably two, maybe three years. And then we'd butcher him. We'd have roast beef. We had steaks. We had all kinds of nice cuts of meat. And uh, we didn't, I don't remember eating much steak, though. It was mostly roast beef. My mother did a really good job of roasting beef and then the mashed potatoes and gravy and the peas and the corn and the, all the nice things that she had, maybe some apple pie or whatever. She was a great cook. She was from Lebanon County, Pennsylvania. She was Pennsylvania Dutch. And the way they, they get their V's and W's reversed, or as they would say, we get our W's and W's reversed. And she would speak, speak Pennsylvania Dutch. And she was a great cook. They all seemed to, her whole family knew how to cook. And I think the Pennsylvania Dutch are very good. Uh, the plain people. We were from plain background. And uh, they, they were great cooks. And, uh, but we always had a bull to butcher. And he was a husky big thing. We kept him in the, what we called the bull pen. And he had a log chain around his neck and a swivel right here under his neck. There was a swivel. And then the chain went up to a big beam in the barn. It was an old beam probably, uh, I'd say it was probably 12 by maybe 16, a beam. This log chain was up there. That was to protect us from the bull if he ever got loose. And uh, he would, uh, he'd have this chain. And every now and then, um, he was there for breeding purposes. And every now and then, he'd get his foot down over the chain a little bit. The chain kind of went around and up. And he could walk all around the pen. And I remember my dad having to go in there and, and lifting his leg up and get it up over the chain, pulling the chain down around. But it was... It was a time of our lives where we were, uh, having a bull was a dangerous thing. Many bulls have killed farmers. I know of several instances, a friend of mine uh, was mauled by a bull when he was killed. And another friend of mine was mauled and almost didn't make it, uh, just time and again. And we had jerseys where, uh, later on when I was milking on my own, we had Holsteins when I was little, 
we had jerseys and they claimed that a Jersey bull was the most dangerous uh, breed of dairy animals around. They've killed more farmers than any other um, any other breed. And we would be scared and uh, we would dream, we'd have these nightmares at night where we dreamed that the bull got loose and had us up in a hay rack where we'd put the hay for the cattle to eat. We were up there, it was a wooden rack and they were they were powerful. If you ever heard the term strong as a bull, strong as a bull was strong as a bull. And they'd be up there with their head and just going like this into the rack and just busting the rack up and tearing the place apart. And we were up there and the next thing, as soon as he got the rack torn down, he was going to maul us. He was going to gore us. He was going to rip us to pieces. And we would wake up you know, and, and just our hearts would be pounding and we'd be so scared and we were so thankful to wake up. And I remember when we started using AI. Now today, AI means one thing. Back then, AI was artificial insemination, and it was such a blessing. And I even went to school uh, in my later years to learn how to do artificial insemination, and they would, it was, it was a wonderful thing. Uh, it was such a blessing to have that, to not have a bull around. We were constantly scared, constantly having these terrible dreams. And I remember as soon as we started that AI thing, we stopped having those terrible nightmares. And it was, it, was a, it was a real blessing. I'm talking about things I grew up with as a little farm boy, uh, dairy farm. But anyhow, I uh, wanted to say a little bit more about the skunk thing. We, uh, I just, it was just one of those little things that the Lord, I just simply prayed. I didn't cry out to the Lord. I just told him, I said, here's how it is. I don't like to smell skunks. And he took care of that. He'll take care of the little things. We're talking about crying out to the Lord. Sometimes... Our crying might just be a little whimper, and God hears us. But I've had more prayers answered by screaming out, crying out. And I, before I go any further, I want to I read. I looked up these two words, cry out. Uh, and it says, to make a loud sound because of pain, fear, surprise, etc. And I think... Uh, she cried out in pain, it says here. She cried out in pain. I think of a woman in labor. I've been with my wife in the labor room at the hospital before our, our children were delivered. And she would cry out. And it wasn't just a little whimper. She would cry out in pain. And she was always so good at having babies. She would just, I mean, it, how do I say this? She was very good at it. At the same time, it wasn't easy. I was there holding her hand, you know, going through all this stuff, sniff, blow, all, blow the feather and all that stuff. You guys that have been with your wives in labor and delivery, uh, we would, she would cry out. You know, it was so excruciating, such pain, and she would cry out. And, uh, some t and another meaning is to speak it in a loud voice, to say something loudly or from a distance. And uh, we're going to talk today about some of the crying out that happened uh, the children of Israel. And all through the Bible, I was just reading, um, just this morning I was reading uh, how many cry out to God there are in the Bible. It was one of Dr. Michael's uh, books, Help God Help, and talked about how many uh, cry outs there were. And I think it was like 50 or 60 maybe throughout the Bible where, where God's people cried out to him and he answered their prayers. Um, I was a dairy farmer most of my life, and I remember we called it the Fayetteville Farm, Fayetteville, Pennsylvania. It was a farm over at Fayetteville. It was part of my wife's family, uh, one of their farms, and, and there was a big shuttle feeder. I told this story before, but it's, it's a good illustration of crying out to God. I was in there, and it was, the cattle were all around. I think we kept our dry cows over there, and, and I was up in the feed bunk. It was probably... 50, 75 feet long, and the cattle would line up on both sides of this bunk. And up above the bunk, about four feet up, there was a shuttle feeder that traveled back and forth. The feed come up in an elevator and out across the shuttle feeder to the center, drop it in, and the shuttle would shuttle down through. There was a belt in there, and it would just drop it off that way, and then it would come back this way and drop it off. And back and forth, it would distribute the feed into this, this feeder. And it started getting worn, and one day it, it, the there were little wheels about this big around that, that traveled on a track on part of this feeder 
and they started coming off. It would jump off, and then the thing would be bouncing and stuff. So I'd have to shut everything down, shut the silo and loader down, shut the conveyor down that brought it up, shut the, the shuttle feeder down, all these motors I had to shut down. It started getting aggravating. And uh, so one day I grabbed a crowbar that I used, crowbar about this long, that I used to get the wheel back on the, uh, on the track. And I was aggravated, and I went out there and pushed the cows out of my way and get up in that feeder, and uh, I didn't shut it down. Number one mistake, I didn't shut it down. I walked up to that thing, and I took that crowbar, and I waited until that feeder got right to me, and I stuck the crowbar in there and went like that, and popped to pop, to pop that wheel up on the track. And that worked pretty good until one day I went out there, I guess I wasn't quite on it. I climbed up there and I went to pop it on that thing, grabbed a hold of me and took that wheel started coming up over my hand and it was about to cut my fingers off and the belt was burning. I was burning the belt on the shuttle feeder and it was tight and I cried out to God. I mean, I didn't say, now, Lord, thank you for being my God and my Savior. It's a beautiful day and all the stuff we say, which is not wrong. It's good to, to acknowledge God for who he is and praise him and do all those things before we really get to what we need and that day I didn't there was nothing I, I'll put my hands over this mic I cried out I, these are the exact words I said I remember it like it was five seconds ago help me God and only it was louder than that I really yelled it out instantly my reaction was to just give my hand a jerk it was tight but I had gloves on and I I jerked so hard that I pulled my fingers out from under that pulley, between the pulley and the track, and my hand came out of there, and I, there was great rejoicing. But I had grooves in my fingers. It didn't cut through the skin, but God answered my prayer. I never had a prayer answered so fast in all my life. And I think it was because I cried out to God. And in, the children of Israel would cry out to God, and, and, and the next sentence was, and God heard their prayer and took care of them. Took, you know, fix whatever it was, he'd take care of them. And uh, so... Um, there were many times in my life where, as I grew up uh, on the farm, there were many times where I had to cry out to God and he would rescue us. Farming, in case you don't know, is one of the most dangerous occupations uh, that you can be in, into. So we had to be really careful. I remember... Back some years ago, we uh, we had we had this venue called Singing in the Barn, and I remember uh, the Spirit of the Lord being there. I remember people coming up to me after a concert. We had Southern Gospel concerts, and I remember uh, people coming up to me, and they said, "When we stepped inside your barn, we immediately felt the Spirit of the Lord." And I remember one Sunday morning Sunday school, one of the ladies that uh, was in my Sunday school class, she was probably 80 at that point. Now, I'm not that old. <laughs> I just turned 72. But this, I might have been in my late 50s, early 60s, and they would say they felt the Spirit of the Lord when we walked in there. People would get in there, and during the concert, the Spirit of the Lord was in there so good, so heavy, so wonderfully there, I remember one Sunday, Sunday morning, Sunday school class, this little lady that was there that night before on a Saturday night, Sunday morning, Sunday school class, she said, I just want to testify. I was just singing the barn last night, and I received healing for whatever it was. I don't know what disease or whatever it was. It was a miraculous healing. As she sat there in the barn, the Spirit of the Lord came on her, and just she was healed by the stripes of Jesus right there on the spot. And um, I remember... Ahead of time, uh, we had a team of people that would come in and just clean the barn down. The birds were still getting in every now and then. You had to check each seat, make sure there wasn't any bird doo-doo on the seats or anything. And it was a team of people to do this. And some of them were spirit-filled, and they, and they went as far as they two, we'd go two by two. And one, uh, one person would go to one end of the row of seats, and another at the other end of the row. And they'd lay their hands on that row of seats and pray over the people that were going to be there that night. And I thought that was really neat. They keep, I didn't come up with that. They came up with that on their own. And they would go down all the way through the barn. There was like a thousand seats in the barn. 
And they go through that whole barn and they would pray over the people that were going to be sitting in that seat that night. And uh, they came to me one night after, one evening after doing this, or one afternoon, it was in the afternoon. And it was in the, I remember it was the back row in the center section, one of the center sections in the back of the barn. They went up to each end of the, of the row and laid their hands on there. And when they started praying, there was like this, they got zapped. It was like an electrical shock went right up their arms, right into their bodies. They felt it. It was the spirit of the Lord. And it was like, they, there was a connection. And it, they were so excited about this. So many great things happened in that old barn. There were people that would get saved. Uh, I remember one night, there was this dear little lady. I just met her the week before. Uh, she came out there to burn some trash. I had a big burn pit there, and she had some paper and stuff and cardboard and stuff she wanted to burn. And I met her, talked to her a little bit. Well, that Saturday night, uh, after she had been there the week before, uh, when we gave the invitation, I usually had the groups do the invitation. They just, whoever they were, whether it was the Booth Brothers or the Isaacs or the Martins or whoever it was, they would give an invitation. And people would come up to the front and give their hearts to the Lord. And I remember that Saturday night, there was this little, this little lady. She was up in her 80s pretty good. Uh, she uh, walked up to the front. And right beside her was this dear little black girl. I'd say she was eight years old. It was a granddaughter of one of my pastor friends that I knew. And uh, she was there right beside this little 80-some-year-old lady. And I remember having the thought, wow, you're never too old and you're never too young. And I was, I was just blessed. I was just blessed. It really blessed me. But uh, I would feel the spirit of the Lord. And it was, it was such a good feeling. And if you don't think feelings are important, Try going without them for a day. Or if you don't think smell is important, try going without it for a day. And so in my sweet spot there in my room, in my kitchen area, as I was sitting there in the chair, sometimes I would smell this beautiful aroma. And there was nothing around that would have produced it. it was not, nobody had sprayed some perfume or anything like that. There would be this sweet smell. It would last for maybe two, three seconds. And then it would just fade away. And I believe it would really believe it was this it was the Lord. It was either Jesus himself or maybe my guardian angel or whatever, whoever from, this, from, from heaven being there. And it was a sweet aroma about them. And it just blessed me. Uh, I, wanted, I want to uh, go next to some of the things that happened in my life, some of the things that happened, I already did that, I'm sorry, I want to go to some of the things that happened in the Bible, in, in the Old Testament and the New Testament, and uh, I just want to start with St. Peter, they were in the boat, and uh, the wind was, had picked up, and it was getting kind of rough out there, and Jesus come, he came walking on the water, how's that, walking on the water, well that's the truth, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now watch this. Jesus come walking on the water, and they were scared. The disciples were scared spitless. Uh, I have some little phrases uh, sometimes that you might not have heard before, but sometimes I make up my own. They were scared spitless. And they were just shaking in their, on their seats, I guess. They weren't, I don't know if they, had, they probably didn't have shoes on, probably had sandals. And they were scared. And Jesus looked at Peter. He said, come, come to me. And uh, Jesus listened to the master. I mean, how much better does it get than the Lord himself saying, come to me. And you're there in the flesh. He says, come to me. So Peter gets out of the boat and starts walking on the water to Jesus. He was doing fine until he took his eyes off of Jesus. And he looked and he saw the waves. The wind was blowing and it was ferocious out there. And he took his eyes off of Jesus and looked off to the side and he started to sink. The moral of the story is you keep your eyes on Jesus all through your life. Don't ever take your eyes off of Jesus. He's the one that we follow, we lead. We have the mind of Christ. And so he took his eyes off of Jesus and he started to sink. And he cried. Uh, maybe later on I'll give you the scripture. He cried out to, go, to Jesus, save me. And Jesus instantly, when, when Peter cried out, he probably screamed to the top of his lungs. He was so scared when he started to sink. He cried out to Jesus. And Jesus instantly re reached out his hand and, and took a hold of him lifted him up, and they walked back to the boat. Uh, I guess on the water, there wasn't any walkways or driveways or anything there at the time. And so they walked back to the boat and got in, went on their merry way. 
Um, so I want to I want to read some things that uh, have to do with crying out to the Lord, and and we're going to kind of talk a lot about crying out loud, and sometimes, like I said before, sometimes we cry, we just cry to the Lord, and it's soft, and He hears even if you're just thinking it. God knows your thoughts, and so. To cry out is to speak loudly, often in an excited or anguished voice. Scripture speaks of the, the object of our crying out. We cry out to the Lord. That is, we lift our voices to Him in an appeal for help. 1 Samuel 7, 8 and Psalm 38, 8 and 107, 13 and 19. When Peter was sinking in the waves, he cried out to Jesus, save him. Jesus did. And our cries to the Lord do not always have to be verbal. Some uh, talked about Hannah praying in deep anguish, but her voice was not heard because she was praying in her heart. And God hears our silent cries as well. That was in 1 Samuel 1, 10 and 13. To cry out to the Lord is to reveal our absolute dependence on Him. In our tearful pleas, I lost my place. We acknowledge our human frailties, weaknesses, and shortcomings our inability to overcome the mounting problems before us. Our cries show that our trust is in him to act on our behalf. We freely surrender self-will to his perfect sovereign will. Psalm 150.15 says, Call upon me in the day of trouble and I will deliver you, and you shall glorify me. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears toward their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the memory of them from the earth. When the righteous cry to help, for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all. And we're going to see the word all uh, several times here. I like the little word all. The word all is, is great. Um, I like when Jesus said, uh, uh, Behold, I give unto you authority over all the power of the enemy. And nothing. The word all and the word nothing are really wonderful I think and nothing it doesn't matter what and nothing shall by any means hurt you I give you unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you nothing you you can stand your ground as a Christian and in the name of Jesus resist Satan and he'll flee from you hallelujah <laughs> James says Submit yourself unto the Lord, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. No questions, he has to flee. And I like to add, uh, I like to embellish stories a little bit. I like to add this line. He will flee from you, quote unquote, with his tail between his legs. I like to see him running in my mind's eye. I see him taking off running, fleeing. Fleeing is not just walking away. Fleeing is running with tail between legs running to try to get away because he has to bow to the voice of the Lord and he has to bow to the name of Jesus. So, moving right along here, I want to talk about uh, him delivering out uh, us out of all of our troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the, cr saves the crushed in spirit, Psalm 34, 15 to 18. And I think this is David um, saying... You keep track of all my sorrows. You have collected my tears in your bottle. You have recorded each one in your book. God sees all this stuff. When you're crying, he, his heart goes out to you. When we call for him to help, God is on our side. Psalm 56, 8 and 9. The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down, the eyes of all look to you and give, and you give them food in due season and you open your hand, you satisfy the desire of every living thing. The Lord, every living thing, God, God satisfies the desires of every living thing. What does that mean? Well, that means people. That means the little birds. That means the the fish of the sea, that means the animals that walk around us. Uh, he satisfies their desire. And they're grateful. They know more about praise than we do sometimes. Do you ever, 
I have eight hens. I call them my little flock. Some people think it's a flock of Christians when I say my flock. But it's my little red hens. Well, you, watch, you watch a hen or most any bird. They'll get a drink. The first thing they do as soon as they get that sip of water, they raise their head and they're like, thank you, Lord, for this sip of water. We just drink a glass of water and don't think anything of it. But we should be praying all the time without, without stop. Uh, be ready to pray at a moment's notice and we take a glass of water. And I've learned to do this. Thank you, Lord, for this glass of water. It's so great. He supplies all of our needs. Uh, but he supplies the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his works. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth, and he fulfills the desire of those who fear him. He also hears their cry and saves them. Wow, we're right on it. Cry out to God. You can be saved right now. You don't have to wait till we're finished here. Cry out to God and let him save your soul. Psalm 145, 14 to 19. He also hears their cry and saves them. God lends his ear, ear to the cries of individuals in their time of sorrow, but God also hears and responds to the corporate pleadings of his people. The children of Israel, we're talking about corporate, the corporate pleadings of his people. As the Hebrew people multiplied in Egypt, so did their suffering under the iron-fisted rule of Pharaoh. Hearing their, the mournful cries of his chosen people, God delivered the Israelites from Egyptian bondage and led them to the promised land. How's that? Nehemiah, who supervised the rebuilding of Jerusalem, wrote, And you saw the affliction of our fathers in Egypt and heard their cry at the Red Sea and performed signs and wonders against Pharaoh and all his servants and all the people of his land. For you knew that they acted arrogantly against our fathers and you made a name for yourself as it is to this day and you divided the sea before them so that they went through the midst of the sea on dry land and you cast their pursuers into the depths as a stone in mighty waters. Nehemiah 9, 9 to 11. Can you imagine millions of people, the children of Israel, up against the Red Sea and Pharaoh's army was right behind him, right behind them. They were, they were just maybe minutes ahead of the Pharaoh's army and they were going to slaughter them. They were going to take everything that they had taken with them out of Egypt. It was a, it was a, a time of great fear. What's God do? They cried out to God. And God delivered them. He, he parted that Red Sea. And they walked through on dry land. How do you get, how do you have a sea bottom that minutes or seconds before you walked through, it was the bottom of the sea and it was soaked, it was wet. It might have been even muddy. But they walked through on dry land. So it's not just a not just the miracle of having the waters parted. It was a dry land was a miracle. They walked through on dry land. And once they were across, the Lord left the water rush back in. I don't know how deep it was. It might have been a 30-foot wall of water on both sides of them. It would have taken faith just to walk in there and walk through. What if this water cuts loose? You know, they had all kinds of things they were wondering about, I guess. But God delivered them when they cried out to him. God hears our cries. And repentant sinners. If you're a sinner today, if you're not saved, you're a sinner. Whether you live a good life or you don't live a good life. Whether you obey the laws or you don't obey the laws. Whether you've killed anybody, you haven't killed anybody. Whoever you are, if you don't have Jesus in your heart, I don't care how much education you have. You can have all kinds of degrees. But you're nothing without Jesus. You can have everything this world has to offer. But if you don't have Jesus, you don't have switch squat. That's another one of my little words I made up. I think my, my wife might have helped me with that one. You, don't, you ain't got nothing if you don't have Jesus. I don't care if you're the president of the United States and you have everything, or, or you're a, a doctor, an attorney, uh, an owner of a great corporation, uh, whatever it is that you have, it's nothing compared to having Jesus. I want to get that into your head. If you're smart and you have the ability to hear me right now, you're going to remember these words if you don't listen. Someday, you need Jesus. We all need Jesus. And I'm, ex I'm, I'm so excited to invite you into the uh, family of God. Uh, there's, there's going to be great, uh, 
explosive growth uh, in the kingdom as each one of you goes out and you share it with your mummies and daddies and your grandpas and grandmas and sisters and brothers and aunties and uncles and cousins and your friends. There's going to be growth, exponential growth. That's the word I want. Exponential growth in the kingdom as you, everybody under the sound of my voice right now, if it's just us and we go out and start reaching out to people and getting them into the kingdom, there will be exponential growth. Jesus said, I would that none would perish. And I'm with him right on that. He said, I come to destroy the works of the devil. And I'm with him. We can all be with him. We can all go out here and destroy the works of the devil. We have the authority in the name of Jesus to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And we can do that. And so um, that's what we need to do. We need to come to Jesus and receive him as our Savior. So God hears your cry if you're a sinner and you're repenting. He hears your cry. Um, you're seeking forgiveness and deliverance. Jesus' parable of two men in prayer, one man is well pleased with himself. The other was a, has a contrite heart. Hear what our Savior has to say about these two men. Here we go. These two men went up into the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus. God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I mean, right in front of this tax collector, he's saying this. He said, I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. Now the word but. Okay, when there's a word but there, it kind of cancels out all that stuff. And here's what's really important. Here's what you really need, need to take heed to. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven. But he beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That's what you need to say. That's what you need to say if you're not a child of God at this point. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Reminds me of a little incident in my life uh, some years ago. There was a man of God preaching, and he was so excited. He loved to preach. Uh, I'm going to say but. But he wanted to say something about his love for preaching. And he said about how he liked to preach. He was a good preacher. I'll, I'll give him that. But he said these words. In fact... I'm just flat out good at preaching. Now, wouldn't that have been better if one of the deacons would have stood up and said that, that he was just flat out good at preaching? Wouldn't it have been much better? Maybe it wasn't so, such a big thing, but to me it just kind of pierced my heart when he said that. You shouldn't have said that, buddy. You shouldn't have said that. It says here uh, that this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. And, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. The, Jew, the corrupt tax collector, a Jewish traitor, steeped in guilt and sin. And maybe you're steeped in guilt and sin. If you are, there's a way out. Approached God with a broken heart and begged for forgiveness. That's what we need to do. Just beg for forgiveness. I have to beg for forgiveness every day because I mess up. Sometimes I'll have thoughts. That, I don't want to have that thought. And so I'll say, Lord, I'm sorry for that thought. I have the mind of Christ. I'm not thinking that thought. I don't like it. I'm sorry. I repent. Please forgive me of that thought. And so, uh, he begged for forgiveness. The Pharisee, an esteemed religious leader, saw himself as a shining example of godliness. Of these two men, God only heard the voice of the tax collector. Both men prayed, but only the tax collector truly cried out to God. And wanted to be saved. Scripture does not teach that we are to lift ourselves by our own bootstraps. Rather, we are to go to him in times of trouble. God cares. He loves us. He stands for us. He stands with us. He delights in coming to our rescue. Isn't that nice? He delights in coming to your rescue. If you're not saved, he's not coming to your rescue. You need to be able... To cry out to Jesus as your Savior and your Lord and your Master and your Healer and your Comforter and your Encourager and your um, 
your protector. Whatever it is that you need, he's there to supply all your needs according to God's riches through Christ Jesus. He'll take care of these things. He stands with us and for us. He delights in coming to our rescue. We may rightly conclude that self-sufficiently is not an attribute of an obedient believer in times of trouble. We are to cry out to the Lord. I want to give credit to the website I was on where I picked some of this stuff up. Uh, let's see. Vatican in Exile. I don't know much about it. It's the first time I was on that website. They had some good stuff. And I only got sorry. That was, that was uh, my introduction. Okay. Now we're ready to get into this. But our time is up. Maybe next time we can uh, continue on with this. Uh, but the moral of the story is cry out to God. He loves you dearly. He wants you to be one of his children. And he will take care of you as any good father should. Father God loves you. He gave his son who came to this earth, became flesh, and dwelt among us and uh, came to be our Savior and our Lord and our Master, our Redeemer, and our soon coming King. Lord, thanks for this time that we could share together. And may each one receive you as their Savior if they haven't already. And reach out and make for exponential growth in your kingdom by bringing people into, the, into your fold, Lord. We love you so much. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.